Hi, everybody. Welcome to Act Now. I'm Juliana Forlano on the program today. John Pavlovitz, I hope you know him. He's a pastor, blogger, author of a new book, If God is Love, Then Don't Be a Jerk. He has other books, and he has uh, an amazing and, and robust Twitter following of, I think I found them, the religious left. The question is, what of the religious left? The religious right has the alliteration. Do we even have the people? We do have the moral. <laughs> we do have the moral integrity. We're going to have a long conversation, I hope, with him about that. I have a lot of thoughts, a lot of interest in this area, and I hope you'll come along with me for the ride. First up is going to be the headlines. Hi, everybody. The U.S. Army unveiled its first ever climate strategy on Tuesday. They did this to come in line with President Joe Biden's executive orders that are aimed at tackling climate change. The Army's climate strategy asked the service to have their greenhouse gas emissions from 20 oh five levels. That's, you know, those levels are still pretty high. It's not just a halving. It's a halving from 2005 levels, but still it's progress. Um, and that has to be done by 2030 and they have to be at net zero by 2050. This is in line with Biden's wider goals for the country. Sure, sure. By 2050, I'll probably have water up to here in the studio and it won't matter because it'll be too hot to have electricity. I don't know what's going to happen, but seriously, the goal isn't isn't close enough is not urgent enough, but it's on its way. So I think that's good. It's, you know, it's a start to get in the direction that we're going. A start is on its way to a win. So anyway, good on Joe Biden. What did Trump do? By the way, let's remember, I like to always call to mind what Trump did, except promise coal deregulation, plow down a butterfly sanctuary to build an unnecessary wall. And uh, I think he opened national lands to drilling. That's that's what the last guy did. So we're moving in the right direction. The interesting part to this, though, is that the new plan focuses on both reducing greenhouse gas emissions and getting infrastructure and soldiers ready for the impact of climate change and the increasing extreme weather events. We got some extreme weather events, so I did to show you. Um, getting soldiers ready may include Oh, John Carly, got to catch up. What happened to you? I got the images. We're flying past my images. Anyway, getting soldiers ready may include changing the conservative soldiers' minds about the actual existence of climate change. A good percentage of soldiers ascribe to the party that continues to deny climate change and call for policies that are cool with like polluting and destroying. I won't name names, but with direct impacts on the soldiers' work, on their missions, on their actual bodies, they're going to be steeped in the conversation that climate change is real. And they're going to be working to mitigate it. And they will be affected by it. And they may just bring their awareness back to the ballot box. We can hope, right? Um, the article in EcoWatch, where I got this from, that you just saw up there, uh, says the following. Oh, no, I got the quote. Hit the quote, John Carl. There you go. The Army seeks to protect its soldiers and infrastructure from extreme weather events, which have already caused problems for the U.S. military. In 2018, Hurricane Florence caused around $3.5 billion in damages to Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. And that's from CNN Reports. The next year, flooding caused $500 million in damages to Alfut Air, ba Air Force Base, say that 10 times fast, up in Nebraska. My outfit is a hopeful outlook, right? That's my, it's a hopeful outlook that, that perhaps getting the Army involved in mitigating against climate change is because of the power, you know, it, it will help. It will help. It will help change minds. Whether the army is addressing the issue now because of their powerful need for their killing stuff to be okay so we can make more stuff for killing, well, that's not so great. But it is a start on changing some hearts and minds that are entrenched in a, a, a vocabulary that's not helpful called climate denial. 
Or perhaps the Army just wants to protect the Super Bowl. We've got an excessive heat watch issued for Los Angeles as the city prepares to host the Super Bowl there. An excessive heat watch is, itch is issued when the extraction and combustion of fossil fuels at such high levels can cause changes to a livable environment. Whereas extremely dangerous heat will continue for three days in a place where it shouldn't be right now. More frequent and extreme heat waves are one of the clearest signals of climate change, which is primarily human caused, according to this IPCC report. It's done. IPCC report, Giancarlo. Th there it is. <laughs> anyway, it's done. It's settled. It's over, which you already know if you watch this show. But it does bear repeating. I just want, wouldn't we all love it if the real weather channel added that little line of an excessive heat watch is issued when the extraction and combustion of fossil fuels at a high level causes changes to a livable environment. And now it's hot at your house. I would just I love a little climate change context in our weather reporting. And moving on to our next story, also under Biden. OK, Biden, he's not a hero, but I'm starting to bristle at the fact that all people of all stripes are making him out to be like Pol Pot. He's not a dictator, he, nor does he have a magic wand that he can just do everything and fix every... Jeez! <clears throat> All right, anyway, under Biden, the U.S. Department of Agriculture is investing $1 billion in projects that encourage farmers, ranchers, and owners of forested land to employ practices that help mitigate the effects of climate change by lowering greenhouse gas emissions or catching and storing carbon. The new program is called the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities. President Biden has committed to cutting agricultural emissions in half by 2030 and has asked farmers to lead the way. Uh, by the way, did we know U.S. agriculture is responsible for more than 10% of the country's greenhouse gas emissions? And that is according to the EPA and their estimates. Um, Secretary of the USDA, Tom Vilsack, said... That as food comp, where's Bill say? We got a nice vote. There he is. He said as food companies and exporters work to reduce the carbon footprint of their supply chain. Oh my God, we're having a little real troubles with our images. Go back one, please. <laughs> there you go. All right. <sighs> Uh, anyway, he's talking about the supply chains, trying to reduce the carbon footprint there, expanding sustainable practices, and he says that it could increase the value of U.S. farm commodities. That was what was reported by Reuters. Cha-ching, right? Farm commodities? Let's appeal to the money issue and not the moral imperative, which is how we got in this mess in the first place. Personally, I'm really looking forward to people finding out that you can follow your moral imperative of do no harm and still have personal and community abundance. Isn't that a nice picture of abundance? <laughs> that, Dar you know, Darwinism may be the way the world uh, we get is given to us, but charitable progressive humanitarianism is the way of the world we can choose to evolve into. And final point here, going back to the money is the only language we speak issue. Here's the quote time, Giancarlo. Vilsack told Reuters, we think there's an emerging opportunity here as consumers demand more sustainably produced food here in the U.S. and certainly in the export market. Well, then, buying those recycled napkins and IPM honeydew melons actually is having an effect here. What we do at home does push policy. Makes me feel good about what I can do. That's it for the headlines. Stay tuned. Our interview is up next. You are watching ACT TV. You're watching ACT TV. I'm Juliana Forlano. Coming up on our interview segment, John Pavlovitz, blogger, author, pastor. His book, well, his blog is Stuff That Needs To Be Said, and it has like more than 100 million views. He has a new book out, If God is Love, Don't Be a Jerk, where he talks about the bedrock ideas of our religions. And he helps us take an honest look at how the beliefs we hold shape our relationships, both to God and to our fellow humans, and to make sure that love has the loud, last loudest word. I was. Why do we have him on today? Because I was asking what happened to the religious left. The religious right is all over the news. It's very easy to fear monger about what they're doing. It's easy to be shocked. So, of course, news media, 
covers what they're doing all the time. Occasionally, as we cover actions in the field, we see the religious left showing up. We see pastors, we see uh, people of the cloth, rabbis, etc., everybody coming to support actions that they care about, but you don't see it breaking over into the mainstream of media. So we're going to talk about what is happening with the religious left with our guest coming up right now. John, thank you so much for being here with me today. Uh, it's just so good to be with you, Juliana. Thanks for the invitation. I asked my friend, I, uh, I said, friend, what happened to the religious left? These are the good friends that you can ask real questions. And she said, go call John. <laughs> I'm like, oh, where did I go? I guess I missed something. Um, but your book is amazing. And it's out right now, by the thank way. The book, if God is love, don't be a jerk. Um, I just have... So many. So let's just jump right in. Um, my last segment was about the environment. Um, so many people find and commune with their sense of the divine in nature, and yet we are plowing it down at an incredible rate. And to me, not taking care of our, you know, God-given natural environment is akin to killing the divine. Do you have any questions around this sub, or excuse me, any comments around this subject of what is happening? with our environment and how it's connected to our religious thoughts and dogmas? Well, I think what you see is it's another example of the cognitive dissonance of people on the right who claim faith in a God of love, who cares for the planet, a God so who so loved the world, and yet they seem to have a disregard for everything provided to them. And it's really one of those things that you can look at from the outside and not understand the disconnect, but for the people who are inside of it, it doesn't even occur to them to treasure what God made because they're so focused on the afterlife that they really, it's inconsequential at times what happens here, which of course people on the left and whether they're religious or not realize how ridiculous that is. Thank you. I'm so glad you said that. It gets me right into, you know, another question um, about the effect that the concept of having an afterlife has on people on the left's ability to forgive. It seems like there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, tyranny on the march in different areas. And yet the people who are being tyrannized are being called on uh, to forgive. Let's talk about that concept. Uh, there's a connection to me between after having this concept of an afterlife, like, and why should I forgive? If God's going to do the forgiving and the punishing, why do I need to do it? You know, maybe it makes it easier for me to forgive if I think this guy's going to get what he deserves when he meets his maker. You know, let's let's, yeah. let's dive into that. Well, these are all uh, ideas that are really easy to weaponize. And the religious right weaponizes that idea because the, the left is supposed to be tolerant, which really translates into we're supposed to abide cruelty and inhumanity and injustice. But the truth is, Jesus, who comes up in my faith tradition, is the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus was very much present. He was in the streets. He was with people. He was fighting all of these systemic ills. And yet he was also had his eyes toward another life. But people on the left who are spiritual, they understand that there is a sacredness to this experience that we have and to people here on the ground and we're not just waiting to get to a better place we're trying to bring heaven down we're trying to make that experience happen here for more people that's very interesting and very disturbing <laughs> i think do they have the numbers i mean it seems like you see these mega churches you see you know the rise of these pastors this the internet has blown prosperity gospel which is you know has yeah. its problems too all over the place. What happened to like the, 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 you know, St. Rose, is it of the little flower, St. Therese of the little flower, you know, this, this, yeah. this tangible idea of, of, as you said, valuing things that we have here now. Well, I think what you see is the religious right. They're getting attention and the people on the left who are more moderate 
they're often leaving organized religion. So they're not necessarily being counted on Sundays. But as you said in the intro, that many people, 100 million people reading my blog, it's not a validation of my writing. It's just it's a confirmation that people are asking these questions and feeling these prompts. And so people are moving, who, people who are more moderate are moving out of organized church, but they're still doing all that work. It's just difficult to measure them or to have some sort of shared expression that cuts through the media. So you will see those incendiary pastors and you won't see the beautiful stuff that's happening in our community because it doesn't trend. Hmm. Isn't that the truth? Well, here we are. I'm hoping to help it trend. That's um, right. <laughs> Uh, how can we get it to be okay to be spiritual on the left again? It seems like mm. we don't talk about it in our politics. I feel like I feel like we have the moral authority, kind of. We're like doing the sharing, and yet somehow, you know, we're willing as you know, we're willing to share. That's like the base of it. And yeah, somehow it's not okay to talk about God. It's not okay to talk. I mean, if we're the, is this, is this something we've been painted with while we're the party of science? So we can't talk about a higher power. I think the right has been so good for decades. They've had a head start on how to organize and how to take the megaphone and get the attention. And also by nature, progressive spirituality, people who have a progressive spirituality, they're not going to thrust their, their, their spirituality on other people. So they're not about power or control. And that's very, a very different energy. So our energy is usually about um, empathy and it's usually about generosity. But again, those things are hard to rally people around for some reason. And it's, it's that we have to make uh, caring for people newsworthy again. We have to make that the norm rather than this ugly, cruel thing that we see in the right. I think, um, you know, as as I've aged and I am aware that people, you know, there are people who are voters now who were infants when 9-11 happened. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, I think people are stepping in to this system where the left says, uh, we don't do we don't do we don't do God stuff. We don't do that mm. on this in this political party. And I'm wondering if you see kind of a way out of that of uh, an, an ability to both. Like, I feel like I'm doing that with this show because I'm like, OK, people, we're going to take we are going to do this. This is the show. Yes. We usually cover activism, people in the streets. Occasionally you'll have um, a pastors and preachers in the streets with the people. I mean, often, mm -hmm. actually, and they will speak with the people. But at the same time, there seems to be this, especially, um, you know, there just seems to be this. You're that's not what we do. And I'm wondering yeah. if you have thoughts on how we can break through that. Well, I have I I believe that the you know the people who read my my writing, for example, they're they're a really disparate group politically, theologically. There's you know atheists, agnostics, Christians, Muslims, and the the beauty of that is that that interfaith collaborative community is possible. But we need to do more with that so that it's visible to give people an alternative. You know, we know the worst of religion. We know the fear and the prejudice and the misogyny and the hatred that it's that it's bred. But there is another side of it. There is this this redemptive idea of loving our neighbor. And so I think I call it the community of the convinced, mm -hmm. those people who all believe that compassion is the better path, whether they're people of faith or not, they have to partner more so that there is a concrete example to people who are sitting there saying there's no place for me in organized religion. There is. You just don't get to see it that often. I don't know. Some organized religions, which I won't name, what's happening above the sort of congregational level is so distasteful and disgusting mm. that it's very hard to stay as part of the organization without diving down, as I've seen many people do, which I won't also name names on that, um, <laughs> uh, without just an immense amount of denial. And the organizations themselves, I'm talking about the Catholic Church and the scandals with yep. the molesting of the children. This is just something with which people cannot abide. And it's not like it's the only scandal that the Catholic church has been involved in over the years. So, and other churches have their own scandals. I get it, whatever, but that's the tradition yeah. that I had to choose whether I wanted to stay part of the organization or uh, run free. Um, your thoughts about, about the, the responsibility of the organization itself and why is that why people are leaving? I think it is. I think 
conservative religion wants an authoritarian, wants control figures, want, wants people in power to have sort of dominion over them. And a progressive spirituality resists that. And that's why, you know, someone said to me, why don't we have uh, Franklin Graham's on the left? Well, we don't want that kind of power holding. We want something that is of the people that is dispersed. And that's really difficult to to create that, I have a system for that. But all religious organizations are gonna have corruption the more power that people are given. And so we really have to do the, the really true work of spirituality in our local communities, I think. I'm always telling people, read what I write and then figure out what that looks like where you are on the ground, because that thing can stay uncorrupted. On your Twitter bio, you say, love your neighbor, get vaccinated. This is about more than you. Can you give us some other examples of where people are kind of getting it wrong? I think over the past three or four years, you know, we have seen, I remember starting to write this book and I was looking at what was happening with the pandemic and the people who were resisting masks and, and later vaccines, and then looking at the protest over the killings of unarmed black people and the counter protests were coming from professed Christians and then all this anti-immigrant rhetoric and over and over I was seeing all the discord and vitriol seemed to be coming from largely white people professing to be followers of Jesus and that to me is the greatest disgrace of our lifetimes that people have so twisted that message that was just so pure and beautiful and others based um, and so that's the work I do is trying to call people back to the the heart of what it means to love your neighbor and to love the least. So when it comes to um, getting the vaccine, the idea here is, OK, you may be skeptical for whatever reason, but, you know, hundreds of thousands of other Americans are out there getting it and they haven't dropped dead yet or been microchipped or whatever they <laughs> are concerned that's right, with. Yes. Um, maybe now you could say, like, give up a little bit of your selfishness of your self-concern for concern for the other and concern for the group. It's a little odd. We talked, I talked in the segment before this about the military and people, you know, they go mostly because they think they're being of service and they will put their bodies on the line for that. And yet, yeah. and, and a lot of the people who are concerned about vaccines or won't get vaccinated or just basically conservatives. I mean, there are liberals who aren't getting vaccinated also, but con a lot of the conservatives, they, they, they support the military. They love the military. They want to do yes. hey, the military and you're putting your body on the line. But when it comes time for them to maybe do something that they think is, you know, scary or whatever, they, they just don't do it. And then they yell for personal freedom. Well, and also you see uh, in a lot of these people, it's really not about fear or skepticism of those things. It's about tribalism because to get vaccinated, somehow they twisted that as some, some, some sort of uh, defeat to the left. And that's what I think <laughs> Trump, Trump has done. He has made these expressions of, of our common good. He has made them somehow character flaws. And so it's not about necessarily about the safety because the, the, the data shows that it's safe. It's really about, I don't want to have a win for the progressives or for Biden. And that's, again, having your morality and your politics is so toxic, uh, so entwined that way. Do you think that Trump is evil? Uh, I'd say as close as the definition as we have, I, I would say he is um, completely without working morality. He seems to be able to just take on them, you know, the Christian right. He, Donald Trump, doesn't have a religious, you know, impulse at all, and a moral impulse, a kind, an impulse for kindness. I think the religious right said we'll use him just as much as he's going to use us. So we'll place our morality and work that through him. Um, I think Donald Trump is someone who's completely devoid of of empathy. How do you, how do people not see that? I mean, as a pastor, you work with groups of people who are professing, uh, you know, who are trying to whatever, get <laughs> closer to their yeah. self, <laughs> their God, their, you know, whatever. Um, how, how have you like put on a, an outfit and gone into one of these evangelical churches where they're preaching a lot of hate and just trying to get a sense of like, how is this, how is this happening? 
yeah, I wanted to do like an undercover liberal and just go into all these churches. But I do talk to these people a lot. And I came out of churches where I understand uh, there, there's a story that they tell themselves. And that story is historically Christian and Republican are the same thing. American and Christian are the same thing. And so they will do anything to keep have that story be true. So they know Donald Trump. They may have thought, well, I'll just make this uneasy alliance. But what they've had to do now is over and over double down on him. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain point where you lose your moral compass, where you have no working morality to stand on any longer. And that's the sad part. It's really now about people who refuse to admit they were mistaken. And what a, at the core of it, that's what it is. And that what a horrible thing to have to put people through just to just to avoid saying, hey, I, I was wrong. If they said they were wrong, we'd be like, oh, thank God. You know, yeah, there was a relief yeah. for folks to just say, oh, good. Oh, you know, I don't yeah. know. I know because I'm um, a therapist by trade that uh, children who are brought up with trauma, which is like everyone on the planet, you know, it's traumatizing just to live here. Um, yeah. It can often feel like they cannot say they were wrong because in their minds it has become um, attached to the fear of violence and the fear of retribution, which also is in, you know, the fear yeah. of going to hell, all of that lines up. So this, this admitting that you're wrong is not a, it's not a possible, it's almost like it's stuck, their, their brains just won't allow it. Yeah. And you, and two things on that are really important. We have something like Fox news and we have the religious, you know, pastors, the religious churches leveraging this fear and over and over again. And when people are terrified, they're not at their best. And we <laughs> see tens of millions of people who are in this state of constant urgency because the people around them have created that. And the other thing is that when you begin to deviate, you, you risk losing your community, your religious community. And that's really a powerful attraction. And people will do almost anything to stay in that community. And that's where the, the toxic tribalism comes. Oh, God, that's so sad. Your new book, If God is Love, Don't Be a Jerk, is on shelves. Here's the here's the here's the cover. So when you go looking, you will see it. Um, talk about why you decided to write this book at this time. Well, as I was saying, you know, I started writing this in January of 2020. And it was a little bit different book, some of the same themes, but it was a very different take on it. And as everything started to unfold in 2020 and realizing how much anger and discrimination and exclusion seemed to be coming from professed Christians, I just felt a responsibility to speak into the very unique circumstances of that time. And it became like a journal about all of that, all this that was happening, but viewed through the lens of my progressive faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just felt like it was it was time. Certain things could not be talked around. They had to be explicitly stated. Yes. And I love, 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 love the title of your um, your blog. Oh, tell me what it is again. I had it written stuff, down in here. It's stuff that needs to be said. Yeah, stuff that needs to be said. So perfect. So absolutely perfect. Um, did you think that the right was going to listen to the admonitions of the book or was the, was the impetus to really get, get the left or center to say, you know, he, um, to just feel heard or feel supported that they weren't mm. alone in their opinions? Well, you, you know, I'm, a, I'm, um, an honest person. I I'm connected to reality so that I, I know there are not a lot of conservative Christians who are going to openly read this, but my hope is that I can reach the people that they live with or the people that they go to church with or that they're friends with. Yeah. And I hope that it permeates. And really a lot of the, you know, I try to state in the book, I'm not just diagnosing this toxic thing and saying, look what a bunch of jerks you are. I'm copying to my own fraudulence and inconsistency and hypocrisy. And I hope that some conservatives do uh, uh, find it approachable because the heart of this is that the, I don't see them as the enemy. They may be the obstacle to diversity and to justice, but they're not the enemy because I want all these things for them as well. You know, I want clean air for their children. I want universal health care for their families. And so I'm not fighting with them. I'm fighting for them. And I hope that some people will see that. There's a tricky dynamic going on. Um, in the world right now where it is very scary to see what the right is doing. Um, it's scary. And then people mm -hmm. 
become scared. <laughs> and then there is a possibility that when, as you said, when you're scared, you're not acting out of your best self. So there have been studies done when people are frightened, they look for a strong man or woman, they look for uh, their mom, <laughs> they look for a yeah. leader. It's like right in the genes, like, oh, some terrible, where's the parent? You know, um, so it's, it's, I mean, what you said about Donald Trump being evil, and then I've always thought that he unleashed and gave permission this like flow of evil that's been, just been going everywhere. And right. I loved what you said about the moral compass just being uh, fried or, you know, um, how do we stop ourselves from being fearful of things that are actually quite frightening. I mean, you've got swastikas mm. marching down the street. You've got Trump flags driving past and menacing. You have got people shooting people's children in, in the front yard for jogging. You know, this is, yep. it's scary. Yeah, it's not frivolous and it's not unfounded. It's, I think it's about right sizing the fears and then responding in a way that's actually productive. So, you know, social media is wonderful and for certain things, but what it does is it artificially inflates the bad news, I think. And so what we have to do is keep reading the news and keep absorbing all the information, but then translating into, okay, so what's my response? What's a productive response? What's a healthy response? What in my community is going to combat whatever it is that burdens me? And again, you see these neo-Nazis visible. Well, then people opposing them, we have to be as visible. There is no other option. You know, this is our place and time in the history of the planet. And I firmly believe we're here to be the, the the opposition to all that as loudly and clearly as we can. Well, I hope we're doing, uh, I hope we're doing that right here at ACT TV. I, you're reminding yeah. me of some little thing that I have to go do, which is they're trying to take the mass mandates out of schools. And, you know, the people who are showing up at the school boards are the angry ones who are getting on the internet and yeah. no one wants to go there and be yes. in that space, but you kind of have to and say, well, you know, uh, until, XYZ happens, we would prefer if the mass mandates stay in place. And there is actually more of us than there are of them. Yes. Just, they are so loud. And that's the key. You know, I had two friends who went to one of the school board meetings and they were surrounded by all these people. And, and yet there were so many people that they knew, these two people knew, who were just online lamenting how terrible it is or they're with their friends rather than showing up and being a visible pushback to that. And that's true. The numbers are that we are the majority and we are just not wielding that well enough. We are not being, um, we're, we're still in that sort of paralyzed response waiting for someone to rescue us. And we are the rescuers. I mean, we're the ones who are going to be doing that. I have compassion for people who've been propagandized and whose minds have been turned against them. That's how I mm -hmm. kind of look at what's going on there. Cause if it's, if it's not for a great spiritual sickness, they wouldn't be in that position. That's how that's I, right. that's how I look at it. That's what, and, and I have all, I were, I live in a red area. I'm a blue girl in red area. Uh, and, um, I find that the people who would otherwise be screaming in my face at the school board meeting, if they run into me at the grocery store and I drop my can of beans, will pick them up and hand them to me. Mm. So I feel like it's a weird life. You know, it's a weird dynamic. Um, it's it, like interpersonally, I have found great generosity of spirit and you know yes. it, it just a my it explodes your mind and then they don't you know uh, john well and ahead. <laughs> you know real quick and I, you know I, i've had uh, those conversations where someone will say well this person in my neighborhood they're so nice and they are nice they they are nice people to you and they have a story that they tell themselves about their own goodness and, and kindness and so that's true and so people are nice to me but i know if I were a person of color who were pulled over on the side of the road, or if I were an immigrant or I were a, a gay teenager, they would treat me differently, or at least the legislation they support would affect me adversely. Mm. And so I know they're nice to me. I just also know that their values are antithetical to many of mine. So I have to balance loving them and relating them interpersonally and yet fighting the systemic ills that they're responsible for. Mm. Well. Do you have any suggestions for our audience about how we fight back against the machine? 
I, this is going to be fought in the small and close. I mean, the big and distant stuff is going to is going to get taken care of uh, down the line. But it's really about the communities we live in, the the places that we know, and the people that we are friends with. We have to build things right where we are, and those ripples, those combined ripples, are what's going to do this work. So it is overwhelming to look at all that stuff out there. So don't worry about the out there yet. Worry about the right here, right now, small, close, and doable. Oh, it's so great to have you on the program. I really appreciate you being here with us. Um, we're speaking with John Pavlovitz. Go to John Pavlovitz. It's P-O-V. You can see it right under here. P-O-V-L-O-V-I-T-Z dot com. Um, you can get the information about the book. You can get the blog posts and all that good stuff. Final words for people who are coming to this video because they saw the title, What Happened to the Progressive Left? Um, on, on where they might want to plug back in. I think you you start in your community doing just productive things. So there's a group here in Raleigh, for example, called Activate Good, and they're a volunteer hub. And I'll show up at places like that and then begin building relationships with people and find out that they may be spiritual and then maybe we're building a community. But it's really about getting out into the world where people are doing good work and you're going to find your tribe of affinity, which may be in a church and it may not. But I think we've just got to make our presence felt. People who believe that empathy is the better path, we have got to be out there doing the work. That's it. John, okay. I told you I could keep you here for two hours, which I am going to do if, <laughs> unless you're like, I got to go. So oh, I forget. <laughs> We, uh, Act TV came out of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, Occupy Wall Street, I don't know if you like were, went to the park or went to any of the parks all across the country where people right. were. Yeah. Yeah. And But at Zuccotti Park, I talk about this a lot on the show, there, there was just this feeling of oneness. It was palpable. There was this energy of oneness. There was also Ooh. some, you could, and then when the police came with their batons, you could really see the difference between that energy and the sort of energy of love and oneness, it seems to me like in a greater sense, it's that energy of love and oneness that like authoritarianism is always trying to club down into some bloody mass and on the ground, that, that kind of thing. It seems like the fight is biblical. I don't know. I never read the Bible, mm. <laughs> but it's certain, you know, and I don't want to be, I don't want to be like on the internet saying the end is near. I mean, although with climate change, the end very well may be near, but it does seem like it is this fight between um, the powers that would have us stay separated yes. and the power of, of oneness. Absolutely. And if you look even at the, the Christian faith, you know, the, the, it's the idea that God so loved the world, not that God loved America or God loved white people. And the truth is the heart of all best faith traditions are this interdependent community that we're all part of, which is fascinating to me doing this work because I've been invited to speak by, you know, Muslim groups and synagogues and humanist conferences and progressive faith communities. I'm rarely invited by a conservative Christian church. And that's, I think, because they're terrified that their story can't stand up to scrutiny. And their, their story is adversarial. They have a faith that needs an enemy. They, they always need to otherize someone in order to validate their faith. But oneness, interdependence, that is what the majority of people who are spiritual believe in, I think. And it's such a, it's like they're conning their flocks because yeah. as you said before, the people are so afraid to see what might be right in front of them because they might lose their community, their sense of oneness there. But that's not really a sense of oneness. That's not no, interdependence. I, and I was released from that. You know, I was, uh, my church uh, years ago and I was pushing back against some of the things in the church and was eventually fired from the church for that. I was actually released to express this more fully because I was always having to couch my language and it was always about preserving the institution. And, you know, I had to believe that Muslims were somehow dangerous or that um, LGBTQ people had some agenda that was going to destroy the church. And once I was able to give up those ridiculous facades, those fights, then you can embrace diverse humanity without any reservation. And it is it's so much the better path. Let's start a hashtag, take back Jesus, because, <laughs> you know, like, uh, it's like they well, took Jesus from me on some and that's, 
that's the work that, you know, that is the hardest to do because for, for so many people that you're speaking about, the religious left, they almost can't identify as Christian anymore because of what that word now you know, associates them with. And it's, it's, like it's a really, if I put the yeah. flag out, my neighbors are going to be like, what happened? You know, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, and, and it and it does lead to like a sense of homelessness, and people feel spiritually orphaned, and that's why the religious left is not as visible because people are still trying to figure out where do I belong and how do I fit in now that I have belief, but I can't be a part of that thing that I used to be part of. Oh, tell me about it. I'm living that life. Although I yeah. jumped out at seven when the priest told me that cats um, do not go to heaven, <laughs> and I was like, "You are wrong." This whole thing is a bullshit, and I was out of there. <laughs> I've I've met a couple that I'm sure aren't there, but that's another. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, sure. No, but that's yeah, and I grew up Roman Catholic too, and what I had to outgrow or or uh, pull away from was the idea of the guilt and the fear and a God who was always out to squash you. And yeah. when you look at the Christian right, that's a lot of this too. Their people are ultimately terrified of a God who doesn't want them to get it wrong, and that's what a sad thing. Another reason why they can't admit that maybe they'd been wrong. That's right. And to, because they also feel, you know, I'm arguing with people's, I'm arguing with other people's God, you know, because I can remember thinking, I don't know people's lives, like LGBTQ people that I began to meet, um, life began to argue with my theology. And it was difficult because I said, do, you know, do I lean into these people that I'm meeting who are telling me a different story that I was raised in? And I had to decide what I was going to choose. And ultimately, I choose I chose to be a, someone who learned and, and grew rather than staying in that safe religious thing. But a lot of people can't do that. Well, that's very free thinking of you and religion, which usually starts for people with the mother's milk, um, <laughs> doesn't really encourage free thinking. Now, does it? Well, what it does is it prizes certainty and certainty becomes the thing that you worship. It's or not following. about necessarily, it's, yeah, it's not necessarily about what you believe. It's you saying, I believe this. And you, you know, so many of the people we're talking about, if you actually show them the teachings of Jesus or the Bible, they haven't really read it. They say they love the Bible, but they haven't really read it to the <laughs> point where they want to em embody the compassionate heart of Jesus. They just want to be able to weaponize it. And so that's, that, that's the sad part. That is, and the work that you're doing is incredibly valuable, useful, and necessary. I'm very um, blessed and graced that you would come on our program to have this conversation. The new book, again, If God is Love, Don't Be a Jerk. There's a lot in this book that I'm not going to have a chance to talk to you about because even if you could stay for four hours, we have to <laughs> we have to get off. Um, but maybe you'll come back and and have further discussions with us. I hope you will. I would be honored. Thank you so much. Yeah, anytime. Would love it. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. You're watching Act TV. Did you like the show? I don't, you know, if you're listening closely to this program, you're seeing where we're going. We're trying to uh, embrace a little bit more of um, the power that comes with. Uh, the secret spirituality that many lefties can't perfect. Well, it's like we can't talk about that. Forget about it. <laughs> anyway, more on that in a bit. You're watching ACT TV. I will see you on Tuesday when I have some fun headlines I'm doing with uh, Katie Helper from the Katie Helper Show. And uh, she is also the co-host of Useful Idiots with Matt Taibbi on the internets. I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks for watching.